Hey friends, it's time to talk about Evo Devo. This is the start of my planned series of conversations about this particular discipline that I like very much. I'm taking this opportunity to talk about stuff that I enjoy, so it's going to be very much a personal perspective. You are allowed to disagree with me, and in fact I'm planning to have live threads after every entry so you can openly argue. It should be fun. I thought I'd start with the most basic concept of them all. What the heck is Evo Devo? That's a good question, especially since it gives me an opportunity to be opinionated. So here's my cynical answer. Evo Devo is a label. It's a gimmick. It's PR. For a little context on why I'm saying that, it's because it's because I suffered through a decade of being associated with another label as a new atheist. It was annoying because it brought a measure of media attention to a few people, but when you got down to it, it was meaningless. There was nothing new about this atheism. When we got together in our secret atheist cabals, we would all say, I don't know what's new here. I don't know what to say when the media asks us about it, but still, we ought to milk this for everything it's worth. So one of the giveaways about Evo Devo is when you see it called the new science of Evo Devo. That's about as significant as this new label on a bottle of shampoo. It's one of the oldest tricks in the advertising game. What's new about it? They don't say it's shampoo. Maybe they change one of the chemicals in it. I don't know, and I don't know why it should make me want to buy it instead of old shampoo. My shampoo also says it has an energizing formula. Maybe we missed a trick. We should have called it the energizing science of Evo Devo. Note, I'm disagreeing with one word in the cover blurb for Sean Carroll's Endless Forms Most Beautiful, but really, you can't go wrong by reading this book. It's an excellent introduction to the field, even if I disagree with some bits and pieces. In fact, if you haven't read it, Maybe you'd be better off turning off this video and going over to your library and start reading or rereading it. I'm still going to have the effrontery to disagree with some parts of the book. Let's take a look at a small piece of the introduction. Carol says, The key to understanding form is development, the process through which a single-celled egg gives rise to a complex, multi-billion-celled animal. This amazing spectacle stood as one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of biology for nearly two centuries. Well, longer than that, and it isn't solved yet. And development is intimately connected to evolution because through changes in embryos, the changes in form arise. Yes, enthusiastic agreement. Development is the core, I agree, and that's what I want to talk about today. I do disagree to some extent with what Carol writes next. Over the past two decades, a new revelation has unfolded in biology. Advances in developmental biology and evolutionary bio developmental biology, dubbed Evo Devo, have revealed a great deal about the invisible genes and some simple rules that shape animal form and evolution. Much of what we have learned has been so stunning and unexpected that it has profoundly reshaped a picture of how evolution works. Not a single biologist, for example, ever anticipated that the same genes that control the making of an insect's body and organs also controlled the making of our bodies. Now, I don't mean to start off so negatively, but one of the things I want to do today is make, it, make a case that Evo Devo is actually fairly old as biological sciences go. It's not that new and represents an evolution, not a revolution, of our progressive understanding of biology. It also has not profoundly shaped our picture of how evol evolution works. That's, that's just hype. It might be literally true that no one realized the extent of our shared genes across phyla, but in part that's because our understanding of what genes are has only relatively recently become something more than an abstraction. But natural historians are trying to identify a unifying principle behind the organization of life on Earth over 200 years ago. So it's a bit unfair to accuse Geoffroy St. Hilaire or Ernst Haeckel, for instance, with a failure of imagination, when their flaw was usually an excess of imagination, pushing the evidence beyond what was reasonable for their era. 
But still, what's great about it is that it represents a synthesis, the bringing together of the dual strands of evolutionary biology and developmental biology combined with the amalgam of genetics and molecular biology. Rather than being revolutionary, it's more the natural outcome of the progression of science. After all, that unity of genes has been around for a billion years. It's just that we're only now acquiring the ability to see it. To do Evo Devo, you need to have an understanding of multiple complex disciplines, and you need to appreciate how they complement each other. That's the real power of the science. However, lots of sciences do that. For instance, biochemistry and evolutionary biology go together beautifully. There's a large literature on the evolution of metabolic pathways. It's a fascinating and has brought a new understanding to our knowledge of life on Earth. We just don't have a catchy pop culture label to attach to it. Evolution is such a central idea to all of biology that you can take any subdiscipline in the field, say physiology or genetics or immunology or epidemiology or microbiology, stick an Evo in front of the name and you would have a valid subject name. And you'd probably be able to find researchers who are already working on it. Okay, one exception. If you stick evolutionary in front of psychology, you get a lot of junk science. Basically, the Evo in the name is redundant. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, a phrase I heard somewhere, which means that Evo Devo reduces to just developmental biology. If you can't get excited about developmental biology, which you should, then you shouldn't get worked up about Evo Devo which gives me an idea. I hear a lot of students complaining about taking biochemistry because it's hard and seems somewhat abstract and hard to relate to. Maybe if we called it Evo Biochem, it would generate more enthusiasm without actually having to modify the content of the course. See, it's PR. Nothing wrong with that, but just know that Evo is universal and makes everything cool. Uh, that doesn't mean that Evo Devo is superficial, though. To return to an earlier point, Evo Devo is a synthetic discipline. It brings multiple lines of thought together to generate new ideas. In addition to the obvious combination of evolutionary and developmental biology, Evo Devo also integrates molecular biology and genetics, and that's what makes it exciting, energizing even that all of these approaches have multiplicative effects, creating a more powerful tool for studying biology. But the core of Evo Devo, the things that makes it unique, is development. It's why I'm in this business, and it's what makes me personally excited about Evo Devo. And I have to explain how I ended up here. Probably the first big influence on me, and also on the biology of the time, was this book, John Tyler Bonner's On Development. I remember wandering through the bookstore at DePaul University as a first-year college student, bored because it, I hadn't yet taken a course in biology. First, I had to get a foundation in chemistry and math, looking for something to remind me why I was a biology ma major, and there was this slim gray book. It was fantastic. It is fantastic. Written by a biologist who studied cellular slime molds, it, it got right into the key questions of the field. Once I had the opportunity to work in a research lab, I gravitated towards developmental biology labs and never left. I strongly recommend this text even now, if development interests you at all. It's also important because even now, Evo Devo is too strongly focused on animal development. Taking a little time to focus on non-metazoan eukaryotes is a good step towards broadening your perspective. And Bonner writes about development in unexpected places like protists and viruses and fungi, and even in the differentiation of castes in ants. So this is actually my well-worn original copy purchased 45 years ago. Yeah, with the cover starting to fall off. I blame this book for shaping my views for almost half a century and recommend it without reservation, especially if you want to learn about the real breadth of developmental biology. We otherwise tend to get carried away with our enthusiasm for charismatic megafauna, you know, like fruit flies and spiders. The second big influence is this one. 
on Growth and Form by Darcy Wentworth Thompson. I don't know a single developmental biologist who hasn't read this book and been blown away. I know they're out there. I just don't want to know them. Joke. That's a joke. This is not an Evo Devo book. The first edition came out around 1914, and Thompson is not very impressed with this new science of genetics, and it shows. Rather than genes, he attributes form and pattern to elegant mathematical properties of organisms. But it's beautiful. Variation in forms becomes a mathematical transformation built on universal rules. It also expresses the most important un idea in understanding life that I know. It's this one sentence. Everything is the way it is because of how it got that way. Now, I've seen that quoted all over the place, but I've been unable to find it in the text. I think it's one of the emergent properties of the work that I don't, that it didn't need to be explicitly encoded. But it's everywhere in this text and in developmental biology. It's the idea that what you need to know to understand an organism isn't teleological. It's not its purpose that matters, but the process that produces it. When asking why an elephant has a trunk, explaining what it does for the animal isn't as profound as figuring out how it is constructed on either a developmental or evolutionary scale. Prioritize process over utility. Focus on mechanisms rather than on what you think it is for. And that's about the most profoundly evolutionary principle I can think of. Incidentally, a few years after reading Bonner, I picked up this book, Ontogeny and Phylogeny by Stephen Jay Gould. It's another one I recommend highly and which was strongly influential in the forming discipline of Evo Devo. I have to point to the dedication of this book. To the Phylomorphs of Cambridge, the world and beyond, where Darcy Thompson must lie in the bosom of Abraham. Yeah, the intellectual lineage of Evo Devo is deep. And I do think it's a mistake to label it as new. There's another phrase I want to highlight because it's also important. It was written in 1973 by Lee Van Valen, although I didn't read it until I got in, into graduate school. He wrote, evolution is the control of development by ecology. And that's also beautiful. And it ties the whole story together. Development is one piece of the puzzle, and you have to combine it with ecology and evolution to get the full picture. It only took me a few decades to appreciate the importance of this aphorism. It's why I recently began working on spiders, because they add variation environmental influences to the study of development. And I'll be returning to this theme later in this series. Okay, I've been ragging on Sean Carroll about his use of the term new for a while now, and He's smarter than I am, so I should acknowledge that there is a sense in which he's right. The current implementation of Evo Devo is strongly dependent on the one-two punch of genetics and molecular biology applied to the long-standing questions about the development of form. And that combo is more recent. If I had to pin the emergence of that discipline to a single event, I'd have to say it arose with the saturation mutagenesis experiments of Christiana and Nusslein Volhard and Eric Vishaus in the late 70s and 80s, and the amazing results they obtained. Of course, you can trace those ideas in those experiments back to Lewis in the 1960s and Bateson in the 1890s, but Nusslein Volhard and Vishaus ripped the whole topic wide open with some remarkable analyses. But I'll talk about that next week. Stay tuned. Click the subscribe button. So, a uh, word about what I'm trying to do here. It's not as if having me lecture at you from a computer screen is an adequate way to teach. So, something else I'd like to do is have a discussion with viewers about the ideas I'm talking about. So, I'll have a live stream on Friday at noon, my time, to talk about this subject further, to take questions and to get feedback. Be sure to have read all the books I mentioned by then. No, not really. We can talk in a general way about the ideas. Don't panic. No homework. No tests. On Friday, I'll also post a link to the specific paper I'll be discussing next week. 
That's my plan for this series anyway. I'll do a solo talk about some paper in Evo Devo midweek, have a discussion about it at the end of the week, and also let you know then what I'll talk about the next week. And from now on, I will narrow the topic to some specific paper in the field, unlike this ramble through general background. We'll see how well that holds up after contact with the reality of YouTube and fickle audiences. Click on subscribe if you want to follow me and see how this experiment proceeds. In particular, I'll announce up front that creationists and conversations about creationists are not welcome here. Real science doesn't waste time with those bozos, so let's confine yourself to the good juicy stuff here, okay? So, thanks very much to my patrons who have been supporting this outreach work. If this were a medium that allowed this kind of thing, I'd encourage you to applaud for the people you see scrolling by. Thanks again, and if you want to help out, you can join them at patreon.com slash pzmyers, or click on the thumbs up down below. That's, that's good enough. Also, what you see in the background is the view from my home office window. I get to watch birds when I'm bored, even if I'd rather be looking at spiders right now. All right, super duper hot tip. You may have noticed me waving books around. That's because if you want to learn the stuff, you can't get it from a YouTube video, he says from a YouTube video. Uh, I've noticed that a lot of people on YouTube seem to have gotten their science from other YouTube videos. That doesn't work. The information density in a text is much greater than you're going to find in a YouTube video, which is kind of the equivalent of a greeting card. So just to say, read more. If you want to talk about this stuff, read this stuff. Yeah, there I am. That, that'll, that'll draw in lots of viewers, yeah, chastising the audience. It's always good. Okay. Talk to you later.